The National Broadcasting Company brings you the latest news. Each Sunday at this time, we call in members of NBC's European and Far Eastern staffs for direct reports by shortwave radio. Today, we are to hear first from correspondents stationed in the key capitals of war-torn Europe. We'll turn first to the Middle East, to one of the continent's few still neutral nations, to Turkey. Martin Agronsky reports direct from the Turkish capital, so go ahead, Ankara. Hello, NBC. This is Martin Agronsky calling from Ankara, Turkey. As the armies of Russia and Germany are drawn nearer to the frontiers of the Near and Middle East, interest in this part of the world tends to center more and more on Britain's probable plans and visible preparations in the hinterland behind the Soviet's Caucasian frontiers. While it had always been assumed that the British would back up the Soviet forces in the event of a German attack on the Caucasus, there has been considerable speculation as to whether the British would confine their support to supplies, keeping intact their own army for the defense of the Middle East. I'm reliably informed now that following conferences in London, in Moscow, and in Tehran, the British have decided to go the whole hog as far as the defense of the Caucasus is concerned. British troops will man British weapons alongside the Red Army if, when Hitler's armies reach the Caucasian foothills, the German Führer commands his legions to follow the road to the east. As far as can be reliably learned, no British troops in any numbers are as yet on the move to their allotted positions in the Caucasus. But high-ranking British staff officers of General Wavell's India Command are already attached to the Red Army's Caucasian headquarters at Tiflis to work out with Russian staff officers the details for the movement and disposition in the near future of British troops. There is, however, no prospect of any British land forces taking a hand now with the Russians or in the near future in operations anywhere outside the Caucasus area. There has been considerable talk to the effect that the British were preparing to send forces from Iran through the Caucasus and down towards the Rostov sector to reinforce the Red Army's attempt to stop the German drive in the south. It should immediately be recognized that the British definitely do not have the strength to undertake any such offensive operation and will be doing well enough if they are able to put a really strong force alongside the Russians to meet the expected attack against the Caucasus itself. The major British preoccupation now and for some time to come is to lay the staff and transportation groundwork in Iran and in the Caucasus for the rapid and large-scale movement of troops and supplies from Iraq and India through Iran into the Caucasian area. Observers arriving here from Iran report this work is moving at full speed. All these preparations should be viewed against the background of the still advancing Nazi armies in the south to appreciate their vital strategic urgency. The conquest of the Caucasus would present Hitler with both Russia's oil and the starting point for an attack on the Middle East. The forces he will be prepared to put up for this prize will be really considerable. The British and the Russians fully realize the danger. This time, the British have every chance not only to see the writing on the wall, but to take steps to prevent its coming true. It's true that for the British, the strategic problem in the Middle East must include the Libyan as well as the Caucasian front. There are persistent reports that a British offensive in the western desert may be only a week or so off now. The British may easily feel that to smash the Axis in Africa is of equal importance with stopping Hitler in the Caucasus. There is certainly much to be said for the argument that a victory in the Western Desert will make the eventual defense of the Caucasus a much easier job for the British High Command in the Middle East. However, countries like Turkey, for example, whose chiefs are straining their ears today for the first rumble of the distant cannonade that approaches daily nearer to their frontiers, have the equally understandable viewpoint that when the time of danger arrives, they want planted behind them a solid British force ready to provide help on a large and sudden scale. What they want to see is enough British force to take care of a two-front war in the one area where Britain is still able to make her force felt. In wartime, politics revolve around force, not diplomacy. And as far as Turkey is concerned, it might prevent a lot of surprises if Britain took that fact to heart, as well as Germany has done. If there's one thing this war has shown, it's that the British are still thinking in terms of divisions while the Germans are acting in terms of armies. Unless British armies and more armies are poured into the Middle East before spring comes, this part of the world will live daily in an increasing political uncertainty 
in an extreme military danger. That's all the news from Turkey. This is Martin Negroski returning in out of the National Broadcasting Company. And now we go to Bern, Switzerland. And he's calling in Lanius in Bern. Charles Lanius in Bern. Adolf Hitler's beer hall explanation of why his so-called invincible armies aren't making the progress promised to me is making a big impression on most of the people on this side of the Atlantic tonight. All of the speech is news in Swiss papers today. Radio stations all over Europe have been blaring out the text and bits of what Hitler said all day long. Coming on the heels of the speeches by Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, most observers view Hitler's address as more of a home contention thing than a reply to the leaders of his enemies. For the first time, Hitler admitted that he expected the war to last in 1943 or longer. That must have sounded strange to those Germans who were led to believe that the conflict would be finished with terror or by Christmas at the latest. It's pointed out that while Hitler blames his lack of victories on bad weather, unfinished roads, and finally, as in the case of Leningrad, to the fact that the German high command didn't really want to take the city anyway, but simply to surround it, the Russians advanced other reasons. The Reds report their army that successfully counterattacked in both the Leningrad and Moscow areas. That their fresh reinforcements are pushing the Germans back at a number of points. As for Hitler's reference to Leningrad, it's recalled that a number of a party of foreign correspondents were taken north to witness the triumphal entry of the Germans into the city as long ago as three months. Then tough Russian resistance forced the Germans to change their plans, and they hurriedly sent the newsmen off to the part of the northern front where the Finns were winning victories. In any case, although the Chancellor's speech was made in the habitual bellicose scornful tone, the German people who have now been officially told what they may have guessed already, that the war is far from over, that they must prepare for hard, painful times to come. Of course, the Germans may find some consolation in Fuhrer's promise that the last battalion in the battlefield will be a German battalion. But having learned something about how Germans think during the time I spent in the ranks, I'm inclined to believe they may be wondering why their leaders so skillfully avoided mentioning German losses when they refuted Stalin's claim and set Russian losses at the fantastically high figure of 8 to 10 million. There must be many people in Germany tonight doing a lot of hard thinking about what their own losses must be. But with all that, the war goes on. The Germans have stopped everywhere except in the Crimea where they are suffering from massacre and case. In Germany itself, the Gestapo was arrested and shot 20 members of an alleged organization, organization of sabotage in Vienna. In Greece, the armed guerrilla forces have attacked German supply columns and killed a number of soldiers. As an answer, the Germans have completely destroyed two villages where the inhabitants were accused of aiding the guerrillas. Fighting is reported in Serbia where the Germans seem unable to control the people they had conquered. More communist sympathizers have been arrested in France. And five people, including a woman doctor, have been shot by a firing squad in Bucharest. This is Charles Lanius and Baron returning you to NBC in New York. Our news roundup continues as we bring you news now from Britain. Harry Brundage, correspondent for the St. Louis Star Times, reports from London. This is Harry T. Brundage speaking to you from London. The time is now eight minutes after one o'clock Monday morning, and the London blackout is at its blackest. In the short time I have been in England, I have seen London bombed and Dover shelled with the long-range guns across the channel in France. I stood recently on Shakespeare Cliff, High above Dover. Across the strait, I could see the red and yellow burst of flame on the French coast. The big German guns fired salvo after salvo. On a more recent night, I stood in Hyde Park here in London while German raiders were in the skies above. The overcast illuminated and reflected the flashes of the Ak Ak gun. The roar of cannon was like distant thunder. Long fingers of light probed the skies. I saw a German bomber spit fire and fall in flames a burning meteor with a long tail of fire. What happened during the alert in London and the shelling of Dover is to me most amazing. The people did not run to shelters. In Dover, a few score, mostly women with babies or small children, strolled slowly to the shelters under those white chalk cliffs. In London, during the raid, few paid any attention to it. Sirens sounded, wailing their warning. People laughed. Pedestrians walked through the blackout. There are dim flashlights twinkling like fireflies on a June night in St. Louis County. Buses and taxi cabs moved easily through faint traffic signals. Behind the blackout curtains, there was life, light and gaiety. 
I was and am impressed with the good humor, the courage, defiance, and the determination of these people. I have another impression. An impression that British civilians in England are entirely too complacent about the whole show. Less than 125,000 men, women, and children are sleeping in air raid shelters. More than 100,000 of the 1 million children evacuated from London have returned to London. 700 children evacuated from Dover returned to the homes and schools in time for the newest shelling of Dover. The complacency of a majority of British civilians in England disturbs a lot of people. Many have said to me, what this country needs to arouse it is an attempted invasion or a new front. I have talked with hundreds of British in high and low places, from dock workers, soldiers, sailors, to high government officials. These conversations lead to the belief there is no demand in England for America's immediate entry into the war. Most folks say, you're shooting already, aren't you not? Why declare war? I am convinced, convinced too, that the people are behind Churchill, 100%. These people are demanding British give all out aid to Russia. There has been considerable controversy in the press as to the extent to which this is being done. But the man in the street is not to know the secrets of government strategy. From these, these same people, I have learned that every British subject knows Germany will be defeated and that victory is just around the corner. The question I ask most frequently is, how does Britain hope to win the war? To this, there is but one answer. Churchill knows how, and he'll see to it. The man on the street is demanding action. So are countless thousands of Canadian soldiers. These want a Western Front. There is a hue and cry for new and able men in the cabinet. There is a demand for new fire and enthusiasm in the government. However, I am told Churchill has set his mind against any ministerial changes. The widespread rumors that there exists between London and Berlin an agreement not to renew bombings of the two capitals has been properly answered by the RAF's new blitz on Berlin. The RAF is now engaged in the greatest air offensive in its history. German raiders have been reported over Britain tonight. Sharp raid was made on the southeast coast town. Thames estuary, anti-aircraft guns went into action when raiders dropped bombs there, most of which fell in the foreshore mud. So far, one raider is reported down. It's interesting to note that the Germans have not been able to count on their radio stations to publicize Hitler's speech. German stations have been off the air pretty regularly recent night. There were, however, broadcasting the speech today. Listeners here in London say that the English version directed toward this country did not conform to the text put out in German and directed the German troops to Norway. This is Harry T. Bundy to the St. Louis Star Times saying good night to you from London and returning now to the National Broadcasting Company in New York. For a report on developments in the fighting fronts to the north of Europe, we switch next to David Anderson in Stockholm, Sweden. Go ahead, please. Hello, NBC. This is David Anderson speaking from Stockholm. A cloud of uncertainty still hangs over the forthcoming finish answer to Secretary Hull's warning. The first draft of the finish answer was completed last Tuesday. And from what I learned at that time from Finnish sources, the Finns had decided to answer America in much the same tone as their earlier answer to Great Britain. It was to have been a more or less evasive reply explaining why they couldn't stop fighting at the present time and attempting to justify what they had done thus far. That answer, according to the original Finnish plan, was to be carried through. The reasons for this cannot be stated definitely here tonight. The Finnish forces tell me that leading men in the Finnish parliament are probably being taken into consultation over the formation of the answer. Some of you may recall earlier reports from Finland saying that a secret session of the parliament was to be held before any answer was published. No official confirmation of this has come in from Finland as yet. A Finnish diplomatic source told me that along with the published Hull warning, America had also made certain demands on the Finnish government. The exact terms of these so-called demands were not mentioned to me by informant, but he said that they were of such a nature that they could not be accepted by Finland. So from this vantage point tonight, it seems unlikely that America can expect a satisfactory answer from the Finns. Even though the Finns would not like to lose the friendship of America, nor involve herself in war with Great Britain. In talks with high-ranking Finnish diplomatic and Swedish government circles this week, I've been repeatedly asked this question. 
What guarantees can America or Great Britain give toward Finland's territorial integrity? You may also recall that this is one of the un unanswered points brought up in discussions between Under Secretary of State Wells and the Finnish minister in Washington, Pokope. According to best Finnish sources, the original draft of the Finnish answer carried a sentence running like this. The whole Finnish frontier from the Gulf of Finland to the Lohi district. We return to the NBC newsroom in New York after this somewhat unexpected termination of the broadcast of David Anderson from Stockholm, Sweden. Before we go to the Pacific Coast for broadcast from the Far East, let us go down to the nation's capital for news from our observer there. We take you now to Earl Godwin reporting from the newsroom in Washington. And good evening to you all. It's a fine, clear, cool evening in your national capital, a day which has been a glorious one for any outdoors pursuit. Thousands of sightseers have been seeing the town and the surrounding oak and hickory autumn coloring at its best. Long lines of visitors have been out in the front door of the Washington Monument most of the day, waiting for that long 500-foot ride up and down. You know that how hollow shaft is literally stuffed with tourists these days. I think that few of these tourists comprehend the tensity of official life here and the fact that in this town are the men who may have the fate of the nation and the world in their hands. Many people seem to believe fate rise, it rides on the passage or defeat of the bill to arm the merchant ships and let them go where they will. That question kept the Senate busy for two weeks and ended in that 50 to 37 vote, which sends it back to the House again. The House has already armed the ships, but they didn't take down the combat zone restrictions, and they'll have a go at that this week under whip, spur, and gag, and will in all probability force it through and do just what the Senate did. That leaves us arming our merchant vessels. That, as a matter of actual fact, hasn't done very much good in times past, but many a man has not shot anybody just because he's been authorized to carry a gun. We don't have too many guns either, cannon that is, certainly not any surplus of anti-aircraft. It also permits American ships to sail right across the ocean to any belligerent port they can make if they can get there. One of the suggestions which has been made by Senator Bridges of New Hampshire is that although we go back to international law and arm the ships and let them sail on the free seas, there is no reason to push them into this exercise of power. Why not let the British shipping take care of their own imports of our goods? There has been considerable suggestion from others along that line. One high official of government hinted to me that there might be a question about American ships taking on this extra risk because British ships are expected now to edge themselves over on the side of British trade and commerce while American ships run the blockade. You'll hear a lot about that possibly and other things if you sit in the House galleries the latter part of this week during the debate. It'll be interesting to hear what the President and his supporters have to say about the evident but flimsy attempt of Mr. Hitler to pin the war blame on Roosevelt. Also, Hitler's orders that German ships will wait to be fired on first, which will have stretched out quite a bit since some of us learned a geography in the school books. As I understand the Nazi naval orders now, a Nazi ship fires on any ship carrying anything the Nazis choose to call munitions of war, but will not fire on an American ship unless the American fires first, so that the American naval vessel, effectively protecting an American craft carrying lumber to Iceland, will be fired on by a Nazi. The Nazis claim the right to sink any American freight vessel they pick out, and they will scream bloody murder, help, or police if Mr. Roosevelt is, persecuti is persecuting us any time an American vessel protects our own flag. There seems to be a feeling tonight that Hitler has stretched himself out a bit too far. In his latest bellicose bellowing, he puts himself alongside of Mr. Roosevelt, and seems to ask the American people to choose between them. And, of course, he will not get very far here with that. The Secretary of the Treasury doesn't often point out in these days how Congress should appropriate. Congress is rather, rather persnickety about where it gets its advice, and the Constitution gives the Congress, you know, the, the right to... Uh, 
and not only the right, but the authority and the necessity of appropriating the money. Well, Rosen, but Mr. Morgenthau has to fill up the Treasury with the cash, and he has on several occasions chided Congress with uh, not wanting to pass a good tax bill at the same time load him up with so many appropriations that he can't find the money. Now he is just as much in earnest now in asking Congress to reduce expenditures by a billion dollars next year as he is in increasing your income tax by an extra 15% simply because the Treasury believes there's too much cash money around, too much spending power, according to them, and they think the way <laughs> the best price control and the best guard against inflation that the Treasury or the government can possibly make is to take some of that money away from it and not let it get into the, uh, not let it get into the inflation era. There's no doubt about it, there is plenty of room for a cut in non-defense spending in this town, in this government. <clears throat> Many a government bureau chief spends most of his time worrying these days, worrying about how to prove he is a defense agency. And that magic term, defense agency, is the only sure way <coughs> to keep on the payroll. You've heard them say that the cook put everything into that dish except the kitchen stove. Well, the defense cooks have even thrown the stove in. You know those nice steel tabletop covers the stove makers have been putting on stoves in the kitchen? Your Uncle Sam, through the person of OPM, has asked the stove manufacturers not to put any more of these nice steel tabletop covers alongside the new stoves, and that will divert, guess how much, 2,500 tons of steel next year. And that's only a little of it. If the government gets as tough and rigid as Don Nelson of OPM says it will, then 1942 is going to be the lean year for fancy gadgets of all sorts, including tinsel on the Christmas tree. And that's all from Washington at this time. That was Earl Godwin. Now we switch network controls from New York to San Francisco as we take you across the nation and an ocean for reports direct from the Far East. First, we hear from the NBC reporter in Manila. Hello, NBC. This is Bert Silent speaking from Manila. Tomorrow is election day in the Philippines. There is little doubt but that the present incumbents, President Manuel L. Quezon and Vice President Sergio Las Mena, will win by a landslide. Even the heat of elections cannot for today throw the war and the alarming Far Eastern situation into the background. The announcement that the American Marines would be withdrawn from Shanghai seems to have brought Japanese-American relations right to the edge of the breaking point. Little, however, will happen in the Far East during the next two or three weeks while Saburo Caruso is in Washington talking peace with America. Incidentally, Mr. Caruso almost didn't get away from Manila last Saturday morning. It seems in his rush to make Clipper connections, he overlooked the little matter of obtaining a visa to land in America. It was only discovered at the last moment. And report has it that a frantic message to Secretary of State Cordell Hull was the only means of making his departure possible. But he's on his way now, and all we can do is wait. Wait for something to happen that the vast majority of opinion agrees is next to impossible. Meanwhile, a situation is growing that will ultimately lead to another Japanese headache. Quietly, but with seeming determination, the Korean Volunteer Corps is building up a large-scale resistance to Japanese domination. From a signed appeal issued by the Korean Volunteer Corps re and reportedly submitted to Washington, I quote the following paragraph. Please take us as your ally, for we were allies with the Treaty of Offense and Defensive Alliance in Peace and War, which was concluded in 1882, as suggested by the United States of America. Give us arms and ammunition. Support us in fighting for our independence. We are 23 million in all, 20 million in Korea, Three million without. We have two million in Manchuria with bitter enmity against Japan, where we were driven out by the Japanese. We have a half million in China proper who are more than willing to fight for both China and Korea. We have 10,000 in Hawaii and the mainland. Why don't you give Koreans a chance to fight side by side with you against our common enemy? Do not discourage Koreans who have waited for 30 years for you to realize your mistake in forsaking your ally Korea and for, for you to raise your hand to smash the rattlesnake so poisonous to humanity and democracy. Thus speaks the Korean Volunteer Corps, which is becoming active in all parts of the Far East 
including Manila. Those in the know claim this movement will ultimately result in Korea regaining the independence she enjoyed for over 4,000 years. All it needs is recognition and help from America. This is Bert Silence speaking. I now return you to NBC. That was Bert Silen from Manila. Once more, we cross the Pacific, this time for a report from the Dutch East Indies. Go ahead, Batavia. Hello, NBC. This is Sidney Albright speaking in Batavia, Java. The time here is 7.55 Monday morning. An unprecedented economic situation has arisen in the Netherlands East Indies, which within the next few months is apt to lead to a complete reorganization of the country's overseas trade, particularly with the United States. The government has asked the large import concerns to increase their stocks. A natural request under the present wartime conditions, but the importer's position is such that he agrees in principle to accumulating reserve stock. However, the credit arrangements with American manufacturers make such a step prohibitive. It was learned that at the time of placing orders in America, even for ordinary purposes, credit must be established immediately. Otherwise, American manufacturers would not accept the orders. Despite the fact that delivery of the goods sometimes takes as long as 18 months. Therefore, the importers must necessarily tie up a tremendous amount of money from their working capital, which lies idle in the States. In some cases, nearly the entire working capital is blocked. Whereas, in ordinary times, the importer can turn over this money three or four times a year. Leading Dutch businessmen realize that the war has created this seller's market for the American manufacturers. On the other hand... Rubber, tin, and other commodities, which are exported from the Indies to the United States, are usually shipped on long-term credit or under terms set by the American buyers. Therefore, the advantages are entirely one-sided. The little brother finances the big brother. And unless some answer is found to this startling discovery within the immediate future, the Indies government will be forced to enter the import business to the extent of advancing funds or guaranteeing the credits of the importers. But in a sense, the government is already in the import business, and they have their own problems. Each and every piece of defense material purchased has been paid for in cash, and at the time of placing the order, not when the article is shipped or delivered. As a result, the government will eventually find that it is in exactly the same position as the importer. At the moment, it is apparently considered worthwhile to maintain the prestige of paying cash for their war supplies. Consequently, the Indians have not requested aid under the lease lend bill. Leading bankers in Batavia are of the opinion that the only way to relieve this pressure is for the government to arrange with the lease lend administrators to protect Dutch credits at the time the order is placed with the American manufacturer and the Indies government to pay either on shipping of the goods or on delivery in the Indies. Meanwhile, the Japanese airline to Timor remains very much in the news over here. The leading papers have been publishing daily articles on the subject without giving many new or striking facts. More to the point was the measure just taken by Dr. Van Moek when he extended the system of export licenses for oil and oil products to Timor. Outsiders might be inclined to think that this is merely a slowing down process. Insiders know better. They remember that from the moment the license system was applied to Japan, the oil stream to that country was completely shut off. And they are convinced that the same will happen to Timor, except for a meager quantity, just enough to let the Portuguese go on driving their few obsolete cars over the bumpy roads of this small island. I now return you to the National Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard a roundup of reports by NBC reporters speaking to you from various worldwide centers of information. Among them were Martin Akronsky from Ankara, Turkey, Charles Lanius from Bern, Switzerland, Harry Brundage from London, England, David Anderson from Stockholm, Sweden, Earl Godwin from Washington, D.C., Bert Silen speaking to you from Manila, and in conclusion, Sidney Albright from Batavia, Java. This is the Blue Network of the National Broadcasting Company.